Uh, our next speaker is uh, Curtis Joe Miller. Uh, the transition from violent, drug-addicted criminal to respected youth worker and native artist was not smooth or quick for Curtis Miller Joe. They got the name wrong in the first? No, oh, Curtis Miller. Curtis Miller Joe? I apologize, thank you. After getting clean, but before he got a criminal record pardon, he was virtually unemployable. It took him 14 years to get a job, said Joe, who overcame abuse as a child and a violent criminal past to win the 2013 Courage to Come Back Award in the social adversity category. His epiphany came during his, his last jail term when he saw a 53-year-old among the 18-year-olds looking for drugs and he thought, wow, this could be me 20 years from now. He got involved in jail with the Native Brotherhood Fellowship and he began his journey as an artist, a powwow dancer, and he began attending sweats. He's now got a permanent full-time job as the child and family uh, youth worker for the Delta School District, where he can identify and relate to troubled kids and act as a mentor. He's here to share his story today. Please welcome, very kindly, Curtis Miller Joe. To present our next award, representing BC Housing, a 13-year partner, and for their ninth year in a row, a gold-presenting community partner, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer for BC Housing Management Commission, Shane Ramsey. Good evening. The category of social adversity recognizes that person who has demonstrated inspirational achievement in their lives in the face of discrimination, abuse, poverty, or other forms of significant adversity. He sat on the front step to keep an eye out for the horseman, the name his mother called the police. Their house was a drug house, and when raids came, the violence was unimaginable. More than once, the police beat his mother in front of him. Today, his grandfather was shooting heroin, and he was keeping watch. And then, his mother screamed for help. His grandfather had overdosed. Together, they dragged him, dumping him into a bath of cold water. They wouldn't phone for help. Death was preferable to the horseman. Check his pockets, son. See if he has any cash, said the mother. She was teaching him not to care, to survive. He was seven years old. His name is Curtis Miller. Curtis grew up in a drug house. Violence and police raids were the norm. When he was seven, he and his two siblings were taken away and split up, each going to different foster families. Curtis was placed with a couple who abused him mentally and physically. For one period, he was locked in a basement for two years, living only on vegetables and curdled milk. He was beaten daily with whips, often by both his caregivers at the same time, often after being awakened from a deep sleep. He began to wet the bed, and to punish him, he had to wash the sheets and sleep in them whether they were dry or not. Sleep in sheets still frozen and stiff from the winter cold. At 11, he stole $20 and ran away. Ran headlong into a life that can only be described as a living hell. Curtis began to live a toxic witch's brew of violence and drugs. He was introduced to heroin at 11, and it was the only thing to give him relief from the misery that cloaked his life like a wet, suffocating blanket. As he grew into manhood, he found himself in and out of juvenile detention. Violence was what he had been taught, and violence was how he coped. Soon, he was involved in prostitution and the drug trade, an enforcer sent to collect money. A fearless, dangerous, and violent man. He was stabbed 20 times and shot twice. He spent over 12 years in prison, and when he was not in prison, he was high. He had enemies and had to always watch his back. It seemed only a matter of time before Curtis would be a bloody statistic. When Curtis was in prison in his 20s, he got his high school diploma. In prison, 
He would make an effort to break the cycle of violence and drugs, but slip back as soon as he was released, until he was 34 years old. Without fanfare, without special portents, he woke up with a desire to change, to reimagine his destiny. He said to himself, I've been really good at being bad. Maybe I should try being good. He was tired of being angry at the world and at himself. He was tired of hurting people, tired of hurting himself. He didn't want to die with this bitterness on his tongue. Without even knowing he had made a decision, Curtis began to change. He joined the Native Brotherhood in prison, and the culture he had been born into began to help him heal. It took five attempts in five different treatment centers, but 18 years ago, Curtis Miller became sober. And for the first time, he was looking forward to his future. Curtis wanted to work with young people at risk. It was a complex process considering his criminal background, but he took all the steps necessary and received a full pardon. He went to university and earned degrees in life skills coaching, working with children and youth, and working with drug and alcohol dependencies. He also unlocked the artist inside and today is a well-respected carver of wood, gold, and silver, as well as a championship powwow dancer. His artwork has been purchased all over the world, but as passionate as he is about his art, his true passion is for the youth he serves. Curtis is a child and youth worker with the Delta School Board. Using his own story, Curtis helps young people steer around the shoals and hazards that he ran aground on at their age. He facilitates groups on making choices and First Nations culture. He is a positive role model for many, many of whom wrote letters in support of his nomination. He inspires them with his remarkable strength. He challenges them to be accountable just as he is now. And most of all, he shows them that every person on this earth has value. Everyone can change, and even the most violent and seemingly hopeless life can be turned around. It takes no more than a simple decision and the courage to come back. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2013 Courage to Come Hello? Hey, how's it going? I got my phone in my hand too. <clears throat> so, thank you for allowing me to come here. I'm honored to be here. Uh, my name is Cujo. <clears throat> Most people know me as Cujo. I come from Seashell. Well, I come from Seattle, but my nation is Seashell, First Nations. I'm Salish. <clears throat> um, so, I'd like to start by telling you about what I do, my job. In my job, I work, for the, I work for the Delta School District, and I work with youth at risk. And my job there is to figure out ways to bring the youth in and keep them interested in going to school, keep them interested in life, keep them interested in just being around. Because they know they're not the ones that are going to get the scholarships. They know they're not going to be the lettermen. They know they're not going to be the jocks and the ones that get all the praise and all that kind of stuff. And they know they're different. When they always ask me, they ask me, they go, you know, what do we get? And, uh, and that impacts me when they ask me that, right? And I think, well, you get me. Oh, right? And so I work really hard. I work really hard with the kids. <clears throat> I develop new programs for them. And I work with the teachers to develop programs. So like um, on, on the video, on the video there, um, there was a part you see and we were in the gym. So in the school that I work at, is, uh, it's actually a French immersion school that I work. And so there's Aboriginal kids and, and non-native kids and uh, brown kids and whatever. It's a big bunch of kids. But, you know, there's kids there, right? So what the school uh, allows me to do and, and uh, asks me to do is that, you know how uh, in uh, a lot of high schools they have that dancing, you know, like they have square dancing or they have 
hip hop dancing section. It was part of the PE class. So they allow me to go in there. I go in there and I teach powwow. So it's part of the, the curriculum where I teach all the kids how to dance and it's for one week, right? So we do that. Um, they asked me to come in and talk in all the, the classes about residential school rather than teaching them about residential schools themselves because they don't really know about it. So they asked me to come in. So I just did it last week. I went in and uh, all the kids sent me letters and they, you know, uh, I got about 30 letters and it was like, you know, they had no idea what went on there. You know, they, they couldn't have got that from a book. Um, <clears throat> so I do that. I've also created um, what's called the peer mentors. So the kids that, that can't, that aren't, the kids that are at risk, the ones that go out and do things at, you know, nighttime, the ones that are, you know, um, less fortunate and stuff like that. I thought, well, you know, what could I do for them? So I, I built up uh, classes that are accredited classes. They're called peer mentor classes. So I have five students in each class, and I take the, the at-risk kids, and what I do is I take them, and I take them to other schools, elementary schools, and I, uh, I get them to work with the kids that are at risk there or kids with mental health issues, because I work with kids with mental health issues too, not just kids at risk, but I work with all the kids in the school. So I get them to work with the kids. And what I do is I, I teach them how to work with other people. Because these people that are at risk are more able to work with people rather than, you know, maybe ABCs and stuff like that. And so they go there and I, and I don't do anything. I just take them over to the school and I sit in the back and I watch them. And I watch them work with the kids and they help all these kids and they go around and they don't get the same kid every time. They get a new kid every time. So they have to learn to work with many, many different kids. And we go there and I work with the teachers and I'm very fortunate to be in a, in a school district where they allow this, uh, you know, thinking, teaching outside the box sort of attitude. And so, and so I'm able to bring them in and, the, and the, a lot of the kids in there are IEPs and so they really need some help. And so when I bring these other kids in, and these kids get a sense of fulfillment, they get a sense of energy, they get a, like, this is their honor roll. This is what, this is what they're going to get. They're going to move on in their life. They're going to remember this. I also do the carvings in the school. So every school that I work at, I try and do this big, giant carving, and they put it up in the school. And, and so I get all these kids together, all these different kind of kids, and and kids with mental health, and kids with autism, and kids that are quirky, and kids with Asperger's, or whatever. And, and I get them together, and I make them, I give them knives. Right? <laughs> right? And I get them with kids, and I give them knives, and I get a fly at her, right? And uh, the only, you know, to be honest, in all the years that I've done this, the only person that's ever cut themselves is me. Because I'm working on it, and all of a sudden they'll do something. I'll look up, and I'll like, hey! And then I'll, I'll be bleeding, right? So... Um, but they do it, and what they learn from that, they learn how to create something from the beginning to the end. They, get a, they, they learn how to do that. They learn how to work together with people that are, they're not necessarily going to hang out with or get along with, right, in real, in real life. Like, they're just not going to do it, right? Like, the, the, the kid that hangs out in the streets is not going to hang out with the kid with the autism, Right? But in this program, and what, what I do, they do, they hang out together, they work together, nobody bugs each other, nobody does anything. And then at the end of it, what I do is I, I, I take pictures of the progress from me from the beginning, from the raw wood, right till the finished, and then I make a book for them. A book, and then we make uh, certificates, master carver certificates. And what these kids do, too, in that, is I get them to, when I teach them enough carving, because it takes months to do this, it's not like overnight, right? So... What I do is they learn enough and then we get the whole school to come in, class by class. And what I do is I get the kids to teach those kids that come in how to do this. I don't teach them nothing. I, I, that's, your, that's your stuff, right? That's it. So they, I just sit there and I just watch them do it. And it's amazing to watch these kids that, that don't really get a chance at, at life a lot of times to be able to do this. And then when it's finished... This big thing gets put up on the wall, you know, and it's a big ceremony, and the newspapers come, and they take pictures, and the, the, the TV comes, and all that kind of stuff, and man, oh man, and their parents, if they have any, or whatever it is, they come, or, you know, people come, and then that's up there for the rest, that'll be up there for as long as the school's up there, and they, they go there when their grandparents and they have a kid, they can show them, that, you know, I made this when I was your age, you know, that's something that they've finished, they completed, um, I, I, also, I also work with the teachers, and I help, also help the teachers um, 
because teachers ask me questions about the kids, and they want to know, they want to know what's, what's, what's going on with the kid. So basically they say, well, sometimes they tell me the kids are lazy and, and, or something like that. And I go, well, you shouldn't say that, you know. Maybe they're not lazy. I said, you know, maybe they're thinking something. You know, maybe they're thinking about, you know, whether or not, you know, they're going to get food tonight or whether or not their mom and dad's going to be drunk or, or whether they're going to be able to sleep or, or, or whatever like that, right? Or else that they fall asleep in class. Like a lot, of, a lot of times they come and they want to sleep. They tell me they want to sleep and I just go tell them, go sleep in my office. Just go, go crash out. I don't care, All right? Because we don't know what's going on for these kids. You know, we don't know. You don't know. You don't go home with them, Right? And it's really important to, to remember that. We have to have empathy. Empathy and compassion. You know, why does a kid, why does a kid get disruptive in class? Why does he, why does he you know, uh, why, does he, why does he attract attention to himself? Well, maybe he doesn't get any attention. We don't know. So you have to kind of look at it, you know, look at it outside the box. So, you know, as educators, you know, as teachers, and that, you have to be able to, to, I know that, I know it's, you know, uh, to your credit, that, to, that you have like 30 kids in a class and you have four blocks a day and then you have two classes, so you have like 400 students you have to work with or 300 a week. And uh, that's a lot, you know, when you have one person that's acting, you know, weird or whatever, that, uh, you know, it's hard to focus on that. But I think that, you know, like pulling them aside and talking to them. And, and what, I, what, I, what, I know that, what I know that works is that giving them a sense of um, responsibility Give them something to do in the class, right? You know, they can't figure this out. Like, you know, like, like Sharon was saying, like a lot of times people can't, they can't figure stuff out. You know, on their own, they need some help. You know, so, you know, we give them, so we give them a sense of leadership in the class. Okay, so, you know, you know, if you want some attention or whatever like that, you know, do it in a healthy way. Do it, don't do everything so where it's like, when they do something, okay, you get down to the office and you go sit in that little room. So everything that, when they do something, is a punitive measures when, the, when, it, when it happens to them, right? Because these guys, I mean, like they're, they're, you know, they're barely hanging on a lot of times. They're barely, barely, they're barely there, man, you know? And they got like a few people that fight for them. And we got to, you know, keep fighting for them and, and helping them to understand. And so, like... Like when I, when I work with the teachers, I, like sometimes, okay, so I'll give an example of like, say, uh, quizzing or testing. So we, you, got a, you got a quiz that's um, 30 questions long, right? This individual does 12 of them. Uh, he, does tw he does 12 questions. In the 12 questions, he gets 12 questions right. It's still a fail, right? It's, it's not a pass. So why not, you know, teach outside the box? Why not mark him on the questions that he got right? Set him up for success, you know? Like, I know it's not, you know, you can't keep doing it, but if you talk to them and say, okay, well, that's great, you know, the next time they'll get 12, the next time they'll get 14, next time they'll get 16, like that, until they're able to do it. You have to build their confidence up. And um, that's the kind of things that I do. Understanding what, what is going on for the kids. Understanding that, that, you know, we need to, like, hang on to these guys. And, 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 and a lot of times we throw them away. We put them in different classes and we throw them away. And then they're, when they're done school, then what? That's it. They end up on 20th. They end up on Hastings Street. They end up, you know, because they have nowhere to go, right? And that's it. You know, kind of like uh, sugarcoat it, right? A lot of times, right? We got them through this here, but we need to do more for these ones. The ones that we throw away are the ones that we need to fight for the most. Those ones that got that get our scholarships and that, they're going to get that anyway. A lot of times, a lot of times their parents have money. A lot of times, you know, they're, 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 they're able to put them through school and pay for all this stuff. These kids aren't going to be able to get that. So we have to figure out ways that we're going to be able to give them that. Give them something. Help them to succeed in life. And that's what I do. That's what I do for my job. And I love my job, and it's great, right? It's crazy. I have lots of crazy things happen, right? And I'm a crazy guy, too, so that makes it even cooler, right? And, and, and we have a lot of fun. And, and my kids, I'll give you an example of my kids. Do These kids that, 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 that have problems, that are at risk, or, you know, they're doing whatever. They went out about three weeks ago. They, they, went, they all went home, and they baked food. Or what do you call that stuff? 
pot, cookies, whatever. They baked. <laughs> yeah, they baked a bunch of stuff and they brought it to school and they put signs all over the school and said, if you bring socks and scarves and, and gloves, you can have pastries. And they went home and, well, I don't know where they got their money from or whatever like that, but they went home and baked all this stuff and they did it for a week and they collected all these clothes so that we could take the clothes down to Hastings Street with food, with bread and, and peanut butter and all that and, and hot chocolate and give it out to the people on the streets. And that's what these kids do. All right, so we need to hang on to that. So I know that my time is, is almost up here. So in closing, I want to just say, I wrote this down because I don't forget. All right, I'm going to forget. Uh, I want to say, you know, let's speak for those who can't speak for themselves and help them find their voice. Fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Help them win their battles. Embrace the discarded. Pull them in. Closer and don't throw them away. Hi, hi. <laughs>